what could you do to improve yourself? Well, let, let's step one step backwards. The first question might be, why should you even bother improving yourself? And I think the answer to that is something like, so you don't suffer any more stupidly than you have to. And maybe so others don't have to either. It's something like that. You know, like there's a real injunction at the bottom of it. It's not some casual self-help doctrine. It's that if you don't organize yourself properly, you'll pay for it, and in a big way, and so will the people around you. Now, and you could say, well, I don't care about that, but that's actually not true. You actually do care about that, because if you're in pain, you will care about it. And so you do care about it, even if it's just that negative way, you know. Um, it's very rare that you can find someone who's in excruciating pain who would ever say, well, it would be no better if I was out of this. It's sort of pain is one of those things that brings the idea that it would be better if it didn't exist along with it. It's incontrovertible. So you get your act together so that there isn't any more stupid pain around you than necessary. Well, so then the question might be, well, how would you go about getting your act together? And the answer to that, and this is a phenomenological idea too, it's something like, look around for something that bothers you and see if you can fix it. So now you think, well, let's say, there, let's say you go into a, you can do this in a room. It's quite fun to do it just when you're sitting in a room, like a room, maybe your bedroom, you can sit there and just sort of meditate on it and think, okay, if I wanted to, spend 10 minutes making this room better, what would I have to do? And you have to ask yourself that, right? It's not a command, it's like a genuine question. And things will pop out in the room that you know, you, like there's a stack of papers over there that's kind of bugging you and you know that maybe little order there would be a good thing and you know, you haven't, there's some rubbish behind your computer monitor that you haven't attended to for like six months and the room would be slightly better if it was a little less dusty and the cables weren't all tangled up the same way. And like, if you, if you allow yourself just to co consider the expanse in which you exist at that moment, there'll be all sorts of things that'll pop out in it that you could just fix. And you know, I might say, well, if you were coming to see me for psychotherapy, the easiest thing for us to do first would just be to get you to organize your room. You think, well, is that psychotherapy? And the answer is, well, it depends on how you conceive the limits of your being. And I would say, start where you can start. You know, if, if something announces itself to you, which is a strange way of thinking about it, as in need of repair, that you could repair, then, hey, fix it. You fix a hundred things like that, your life will be a lot different. You know, I often tell people too, fix the things you repeat every day, because people tend to think of those as trivial, right? You get up, you brush your teeth, you, you have your breakfast, you know, you, you have your routines that you go through every day. Well, th those probably constitute 50% of your life. And people think, well, they're mundane, I don't need to pay attention to them. It's like, no, no, that's exactly wrong. The things you do every day, those are the most important things you do. Hands down. All you have to do is do the arithmetic. You figure it out right away. So, a hundred adjustments to your broader domain of being, and there's a lot less rubbish and there's a lot less rubbish around and a lot fewer traps for you to step into. And so, that's in keeping with Jung's idea about erasing the dis once you've got your mind and your emotions together, and once you're acting that out, then you can extend what you're willing to consider yourself and start fixing up the things that are part of your broader extent. Now, sometimes you don't know how to do that. So you might say, imagine you're walking down Bloor Street and there's this guy who's like alcoholic and schizophrenic and has been on the streets for 10 years. He sort of stumbles towards you and, you know, incoherently mutters something. That's a problem. And it would be good if you could fix it, but you haven't got a clue about how to fix that. You just walk around that and go find something that you could fix because if you muck about in that, not only is it unlikely that you'll help that person, it's very likely that you'll get hurt yourself. So, you know, just because while you're experiencing things announce themselves as in need of repair, doesn't mean that it's you right then and there that should repair them. You have to have some humility. You know, you don't walk up to a helicopter that isn't working and just start tinkering away with it. You have to stay within your domain of competence. But most of the time, if people look at their lives, you know, it's a very interesting thing to do. Uh, I, like the, I like the idea of the room because you can do that at the drop of a hat. You know, you go back to where you live and sit down and think, okay, 
I'm going to make this place better for half an hour. What should I do? And you have to ask. And things will just pop up like mad. And it's partly because your mind is a very strange thing. As soon as you give it a name, a genuine aim, it'll reconfigure the world in keeping with that aim. That, that's actually how you see to begin with. And so if you set it a task, especially, you have to be genuine about it, which is why you have to bring your thoughts and emotions together and then you have to get them in your body so you're acting consistently. You have to be genuine about the aim, but once you aim, the world will reconfigure itself around that aim, which is very strange. And, and it, it's, it's, it's technically true.